programs and microfossils, the tiny little things that live in um, in the marsh sediment. Okay, so if you look at this plot here, here, here you've got the sea, and then you've got intertidal mudflats, and then you've got a low sparsely vegetated marsh, then you've got a more mature marsh higher up, and then you've got uplands, terrestrial environment, like that. The plants that grow, the reason why you've got this mature sort of area with grasses, you've got shrubs and more salt tolerant things here, and then you've got <coughs> no plants whatsoever down here, that's because of the frequency and duration of flooding by the sea. Okay, So because the sea and the tide is very, very regularly covering this area, plants can't grow. It's flooded, it's too saline, it's too waterlogged, so no plants grow. Here, yes, the sea, the tide will rise and fall over that area, but only for short durations. So here you've got specialist colonizers colonizer <coughs> that withstand some degree of waterlogging and salt inundation by salt water. Up here, but you only get the tide getting this far up at very high tides. Okay, so this area is less frequently inundated with less saline water, and therefore you get different vegetation growing there um, because um, they don't have to withstand such harsh conditions. So if you look at the different, um, so this is, um, this is mean tide level here. This is the mean high water, and this is the highest astronomical tide. So you can go highest astronomical tide, these vegetation types grow at that level. Mean high water is the boundary between the sort of mid marsh and the upper marsh. Mean tide level is the boundary between the tidal flat and where the vegetation grows. If you were lucky enough in a core and you were able to pull out bits of vegetation, you might be able to say, okay, this sample forms at mean high water, so you know the tide, you know the tidal elevation for that sample, and then you date it, you can plot that on your sea level curve. The problem is that these don't preserve well in cores, but the diatoms and the forams do, and they do exactly the same as what the plants do. So down in the tidal flat, you get different species. This is what is shown here. These are different species names. Ignore them, it doesn't matter. They're just different organisms um, that, are, that survive at different points along this intertidal foreshore. So you can see here that as you go up and further up the intertidal slope, the different species and their abundances change. And that's what you're looking for in your core sample, in your sea level index point. You're going right. Um, so this, uh, this core sample that we've got is dominated by these species here. These species cluster in the high marsh and therefore I'm confident that that location is between mean high water and highest astronomical tide which you can get from the modern day um, tide tables. If your sample is dominated by these species then you're going to say well I'm, I'm in the mid to low marsh area and I know what tide level that is because you can then um, you can measure that. And these, because these preserve wonderfully well in sediments, you get your core, you chop it up <coughs> like we did, you boil it up, look down the microscope, and you can measure and count all these different species and work out where in the coastal zone that sample accumulated in. That's what gives you your sea level, and then you date it, and that's what gives you your age. So that's kind of how this works. It's using, and um, you can measure these things in the modern environment. Okay, so when you find them in the core, that provides you with the evidence. That's the kind of uniformitarian thing. The present is the key to the past. You wouldn't ordinarily know what diatoms or forams you found in a core where they would live if you hadn't observed them in the environment. So a lot of sea level scientists do this. They go to salt marshes. They take a transect down a salt marsh to the mud flat. They establish what organisms are living in those different spaces, tie them to a tide level, and then when you find the equivalents in a core, and then reconstruct what the time level was um, in your sea level curve. Okay, um, so these, um, the other thing that we can do, uh, so we can do those things to sort of reconstruct sea level, and we can also build computer models that help to reconstruct GIA. 
Okay, so if you have, if you think about it, GIA is to do with isolating of the land um, and uh, is to do with how the land responds to that. Um, and it's also to do with the amount of ice. Okay, so we've got more ice, you have more loading, less ice, less loading. So a model, a geophysical model that predicts GIA has an earth component. So that would be things like how thick is the lithosphere, how thick is the crust, how squishy is the mantle. Because the mantle viscosity is not the same from place to place. So they've tried to simulate and input parameters for that for, for those locations. And you combine it with some parameters that constrain the size, the thickness, the <coughs> shape um, of the ice sheet. And you add those together and it gives you um, predictions of how much subsidence or how much isostatic uplift there has been um, at those different locations in response to those last ice age events. So, all of these little graphs here, uh, this is a sequence um, of, uh, of plots uh, the locations you can probably just about make out, but they're, they're Ireland, these are Ireland, in fact they're all Ireland, I know, these are uh, North Sea, Yorkshire, Norfolk, okay, so we've got um, different places with different curve shapes, basically, and that's because uh, in the British Isles we know that northern parts are more affected by GIA, or more, they're affected by uplift, and the southern parts are affected by substance. But the blue and the red are model predictions. So they are the Earth model, the ice model, these are computer simulations of what GIA is if you've got the Earth crust parameters right and if you know what the ice dimensions were. And um, that's what you'll get. And the, um, the, the, the dots, the circles that you can see on some of these plots are data. So the lines are model, are, are, are simulations, and the dots or the circles are data. And the data are crucial, because the data are observations. Well, they're reconstructions, but they're proxy observations of sea level. And they're important, because they're used to constrain the validity of the models of GIA. So if your model of GIA is wrong, so you look at North Mayo, top right, the models are predicting um, sea level positions that are way at odds with what the data are showing. So either the data are wrong, and there may be reasons for that, or more likely your model's wrong, and therefore you've got your input parameters incorrect and you need to address them. Uh, if you look to the left, Connemara, again in Ireland, so you've got a series of points there, um, that are not constrained, uh, well they are constrained, but they don't overlap well with the, the curve. But then later in the Holocene you've got circles that overlap with the model. So the model's working for the Holocene, but not working very well before that point. Um, the detail of this doesn't really matter. The point is that the models are not necessarily right. Some of them are quite right, and they, that they are checked and they overlap with observations and uh, with data, but others do not. It just really emphasises the importance of sea level data. You can't just rely on a nerd with a computer who will then say, oh, I can simulate GIA, no problem, I'll do it in a computer. Because if, if you put garbage in, you get garbage out. Um, so uh, the data here are very important. And these data are um, from a variety of different areas, but they're sea level index points that have been you know, derived from the methods that I've just explained. Um, and where you get these offsets, you need to then um, you know, adjust your model parameters so they fit with your data. So without any data, you don't have any check on the models. Okay, so let's have a look at some um, rapid climate change events and how that impacted sea level. So, uh, this one is, um, is Meltwater Pulse 1A. Uh, it's the first major Meltwater Pulse uh, that was observed um, associated with the sort of the collapse, the melting and the final collapse of the major ice sheets in the last ice age. Um, and it marks the sort of transition from the last ice age into the Holocene. Um, so as you, I think you know, so this is a temperature reconstruction in this black curve here, uh, 20,000 years ago to the present day. This is the Holocene temperature record. This is the glacial 
period, um, temperature record, and then in between, you've got these wiggles. So the transition between the last ice age and the Holocene was not smooth, not linear. It didn't just get warm and trees start to grow, it wasn't like that. Um, there was a series of major climate change sort of wobbles in a way um, that are partly to do with language factors and partly to do with um, uh, other, other issues, including meltwater. So, what happens? Uh, it started to get warm, so the temperature increased, and this period in red, this warming period, um, is termed the Boeing Analog. It's an interstadial, so it's a short period of time where you get warming, maybe 500 years or so. And um, during that warming period, um, that instigated some rapid melting and disintegration of ice sheets, which put a lot of meltwater into the oceans. And what happened? There was a sea <coughs> level jump. Okay, so here we've got, um, this is the British Isles here, um, and it shows, obviously, Scotland relative sea level at the top, southern England relative sea level at the bottom. So you've got the sort of falling sea level, relative sea level, rising relative sea level. But it doesn't matter whether it's falling or rising, you have a look in the red stripe here. You've either got falling sea level, relative sea level, that suddenly jumps upwards because of a meltwater pulse has caused sea levels to rise very, very quickly in a short period of time. Or you've got already rising sea level that rises even faster and then sort of slows down. So the response of the sea level to this warming period and this sudden melting is that sea level jumped and it rose very, very quickly. Sufficiently so to reverse the isostatic changes that are going on in Scotland or just to rapidly drown coastal areas in southern England. It is thought, or not it is thought, it has been measured. <coughs> there was more than 20 metres of global sea level rise in 500 years. These are rates of 40 to 60 millimetres per year. That is very, very rapid. So the ocean will respond very quickly um, to an um, um, introduction of significant quantities of water mass and meltwater pulse 1A was such meltwater pulse, a sudden release of meltwater over a relatively short space of time and causes the sea to rise very quickly. Uh, and there's evidence of that in all the records in the British Isles. Here's another one. Um, this is the Younger Dryas. So after that meltwater pulse, so you've got this warming into the boiling anorod, meltwater pulse and sea level rise, and then what you have is cooling. You see here, this is the temperature, cools down to a point here where it, it's not quite as cold as the ice age period, but it's pretty cold. <coughs> that period is called the Younger Dryas. It's a well-known period. It is a stadial, not an interstadial. An interstadial is a, is a short warming period, a stadial is a short cooling period. And um, what that did was reverse this sea level trend. So instead of sea level rising, it starts to fall again, or the rate of rise starts to slow. So the Younger Dryas was a cold period. It was a cold period that's thought to be caused by changes in ocean circulation as a result of that meltwater release. So a huge injection of fresh water into the Atlantic Ocean, and the ocean circulation adjusts, the density changes, so you don't get that circulation as you should do. You don't get that temp uh, the, the, the warming, uh, being circulated around, and it gets cold, um, and that's the Younger Dryas. And the response was a sea level fall or a reduction in the rate of rise. And this again was a very abrupt event. So this cooling occurred within a few decades. We know that uh, because of ice records, ice cores show the Younger Dryas quite clearly a rapid, you know, change in temperature by five or ten degrees in just a few decades. This is the mechanism, um, so here we've got, um, this is North America, in Canada, uh, and you've got this massive lake, and this massive lake, this, these are the existing Great Lakes here by the way, or some of them, and there was this enormous glacial lake that was caused by um, ice that had melted that had been ponded by moraines and by behind ice dams and things like that, and it suddenly breached, and it drained um, into the Atlantic through various um, areas. So it puts all this cold fresh water into the North Atlantic that affects um, ocean circulation um, and that meant that 
temperatures cooled and it meant that the sea level, uh, sea level rise either declined or it fell. Uh, this is some evidence of it. So this is um, a, a call record from the ocean, uh, which shows um, sort of temperature indicating foraminifera. So a big spike in these cool, uh, cool loving um, shells during the Younger Dryas. Here we've got tree growth in Scotland. So we've got warming in the Bolling Alarod. Um, quite a lot of trees, Younger Dryas, it gets really cold no trees anymore, and then it gets warmer into the Holocene, and you get trees recolonizing, and this is the temperature reconstruction. So you've got Colin Gallarod, Younger Dryas, Holocene, and you've got the sea level rise, the sea level fall, sea level rise again. Okay, another one. Uh, this is the 8.2 event. 8.2 being 8.2 thousand years ago. Uh, and um, this again was a meltwater pulse. This is the final meltwater pulse, really. So this is the last gasp of the ice sheets um, melting. And what happens when ice sheets melt? Yes, they can trickle incrementally water into the ocean over time. Um, but what they tend to do is react suddenly. And this is a message for um, you know us, a sanitary message for us in terms of Greenland and Antarctica. They don't just sort of slowly melt, you know, bit by bit. And they suddenly go, whoa, and they, there's rapid disintegration or ponded water that rapidly enters into the ocean, and that's a meltwater pulse. So we know that when ice sheets disintegrate, they are meltwater pulses and they have major impact on sea level. So let's hope that our ice sheets don't rapidly disintegrate and cause meltwater pulses today. Because if they did, we couldn't stand a one to three metre sea level jump in a few tens of years <coughs> and whatsoever. So here's the evidence for it. Uh, at the top, um, you've got uh, the green, uh, Greenland ice core, temperature reconstruction from isotopes. Um, and this is the 8.2 event here, uh, this big dip. And so it was a, 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 a the meltwater pulse, um, again, um, caused a cooling event in the North Atlantic. And other things going on in other records at about that same time. But here, this is uh, this is Holland, the Rhine Meuse Delta, or Holland and, and Germany, the Rhine Meuse Delta. We've got sea level rising and then a jump there, uh, an inflection in that curve at 8.2, and um, that coincides with that meltwater pulse. And um, there's lots of other evidence for the 8.2 event around the world as well, um, and it's thought that it's um, yeah, it's to do with rapid disintegration of ice sheets again. Yeah. About one to three meters. Okay, um, just the last few slides now, and this is a complicated one that I'm going to pause at for a, a short while. Um, so this is a, a continual or near continual record of sea level change um, from a salt marsh in um, North America, in North Carolina, by Ken McCallum. So in the bottom, um, the bottom panel here, you can see the seri series of over overlapping boxes. These are little boxes. Each of these boxes is a sea level rise <coughs> point. So, what Andy Kemp did, he went to a salt marsh, did some coring, took a core, chopped it up into samples, looked at the um, foraminifera in those samples, and measured where they occurred in the modern environment so he knew what the tide level was, measured the altitude, and dated the samples. And he's plotted all those boxes up in this little sort of 3D plot um, that shows. Um, how sea level has changed over a 2,000 year period. Okay, so this is 2,000 years here. Uh, and you can see some interesting things. You can see that about between two and 1,000 years ago, the red line, which is the average sea level through that record was about zero. Okay, and even just looking at it by eye, there's not much sea level change going on there. If you have a look at the, um, the, the red line from 1,000 years ago to about 1,500 years ago, it starts to take off, okay? And you get sea level rising at about plus 0.6 millimetres a year. And then after about 1,500s, it stabilises, or arguably there's a slight dip. And then in the last 100 years or so, it goes fuck off, modern sea level rise, and you've got massive um, you know, evidence of sea level change there and in, the, in the modern era. And what Andy Kemp did 
with, uh, uh, well, rightly or wrongly, you can criticise this, but it makes a nice story, so I'll go with that. Um, in the top, you can see uh, the temperature reconstruction from Michael Mann. Um, this is his sort of hockey stick curve, um, showing in the red uh, measured um, Earth temperature, and in the blue, proxy reconstructions. But essentially, what you can see in the blue um, at the top is the medieval climatic anomaly and temperatures tending to be above the average line. So we've got slightly warmer temperatures in some places around the world in the medieval climatic anomaly. And that coincides with the sea level record beginning to rise. So we've got a response potentially there, and um, the sea level rising um, across the salt marsh corresponding with the medieval climatic anomaly. And then later on along this blue line, you can see the, the temperature starts to dip below the central dotted line, and that's the Little Ice Age. Okay, so that's when we had a short period of a few hundred years or so, whereby temperatures on Earth, or at least in the Northern Hemisphere, were tending to be a bit cooler than the, than the climate deteriorated a little bit. North Carolina, salt marsh record, um, the Little Ice Age, there's evidence or some evidence for that in this sort of slowing down or decreasing sea level change from that part of the curve. And then, of course, we've got anthropogenic climate change, global warming, um, and the temperature increases massively, and then so does, um, so does the rate of sea level change over the last um, couple of years. So you've got rates now um, above two millimetres per year for the last hundred years or so. <coughs> so what can we conclude from that? We can conclude that um, these sort of salt marsh reconstructions of sea level um, potentially can correspond and be related to certain known phases of climate change. We can show that sea level rise rates were really quite stable or not particularly <coughs> significant a few thousand years ago. Um, and we can see that the modern rates of sea level rise are way faster than anything that you've seen in the last two or three thousand years. Okay, so that puts, you might think, well, two, two metres of sea level rise, or even if it's five millimetres over the last five, five years, might not seem very much, but it is massive compared to how much sea level change there has been over the last few thousand years. Um, so yeah, it puts into context the, um, you know, the severity and the magnitude really of modern sea level rise compared to um, prehistorical rates. Okay, so the last big question uh, is when did sea level rise start? When did modern sea level rise begin? So this is a paper by Gerald and Woodworth who attempted to try and um, answer this question and they also attempted to answer whether um, the melting or the, the contribution to sea level rise was more to do with Greenland or Antarctica as part of this study. And what they did is that they, um, they explored various sites that you can see in this world map at the top. Um, a, B, C, D and E are all from the Northern Hemisphere from uh, Atlantic coast, either of Europe or North America. And the F and G are from uh, sort of New Zealand, Tasmania, uh, so they're in the Southern Hemisphere. And um, you can see the different sea level curves for these different locations, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, uh, in this panel here. Uh, and I'll draw your attention to sort of two things. The first thing is that all of these reconstructions have, um, uh, have, sort of have crosses or have sea level index points. So they are um, the, the, the reconstructions that they've performed using the sediment data using sea level index points. Um, and they also have um, tide gauge information from in the red and the blue. Okay, so they, that overlaps with the data points. In some places, there isn't a tide gauge, so you just have um, you just have the sea level index points from the reconstruction. So they've got data points that are either reconstructed or measured observational records, and they also all have a trend line in it, which is what this linear straight line is that goes through all of the data. And what they've done there is that they've tried to statistically establish at which point the rate of sea level rise kicks off. So where is the inflection in the curve? So if you look at A and B, you can see here that you know the, the data, the reconstruction data 
and the average sort of re the, the average trend line overlap. So there's no evidence there of any acceleration until this point here, when the data start the observations start to deviate from that average line, and that is the inflection. A at the top, you can see that the reconstructed data has an inflection here above the line that is underneath the data points. C is a really obvious one, so here is steady sea level rise and then suddenly boom, it kicks off and all of a sudden it's above the average amount. Uh, D, E, F, G, same sort of picture. You've got the, the trend line there overlapping with the data, but increasingly the data goes above the line and that's your inflection. So what do they, um, how do those inflection points compare with time on this, on this, on, on this axis here? So this is 1650, 1700s, 1800s, year 2000. So this is the last four or 500 years on this axis. And what they've established <coughs> is the earliest point where, where you get this inflection, this separation from the data from the trend line is 1905 and the latest is 1945. So the answer to the question, according to the evidence in this paper, when did modern sea level rise start? When can we first detect an anthropogenic signal in sea level records? It's between 1905 and 1945, depending on where you are um, in the world. Um, the next thing to conclude is that it doesn't matter whether you're, you base your information on the sea level, on the reconstructed data, or on the observational instrumental data, inflections are in both. So it doesn't matter whether, um, so here's a good example, the black crosses are the reconstructions and the inflection is at the same point as the inflection in the red, which is the tide gauge record. So they're independently verifying each other. And the other thing that you can show quite clearly is that the inflection, so the departure in the sea level records from the average in F and G is massive. Okay, so this is the average sea level here in that line and in that line. This overlaps with the data. And then in the early 1900s, they get this massive separation. And the same with this record, a massive separation of the data being way above the underlying baseline average. And then the inflections in the other curves are not as great. So if you think back to what I was saying earlier in the lecture about fingerprinting <coughs> and meltwater sources, if Greenland melts, and reduces the gravitational attraction, the ocean water essentially sloshes to the southern hemisphere and that's where most of the sea level rise will be measured. If Antarctica is the main contributor to ocean mass gain, then as you lose, as, I, as Antarctica loses mass and the gravitational attraction um, lowers, then essentially that water sloshes to the northern hemisphere and that is where most of the sea level rise will be registered. Well, this is telling us that most of the sea level rise that has been measured over the last 100 years or so is in the southern hemisphere in Tasmania and New Zealand. Because the inflection is massive here, much more pronounced than in the northern hemisphere. And that suggests that the main contributor to ocean mass change over the last 100 years is melting from Greenland. Okay? Because most of the water, most of the response is in the southern hemisphere, which is where you would expect it to be. A comparatively less is from Antarctica because the inflection in the northern hemisphere data is much less. Okay, so these sort of paleo data here is giving us really important information on melt sources and whether Greenland or Antarctica is providing um, more or less of that, that information. And all this is really important because if we still can't solve the sea level budget in terms of um, working out what components add up to the total, these sorts of studies help us um, towards that goal. So it's a really, really important side to this. Okay, so what can we conclude then? Um, what we've seen up is rising, going that anyone will tell you anything otherwise, and the rate is accelerating. That's uh, it's caused by two main things. It's caused by melting ice, which is causing mass change in the ocean, and, uh, and caused by volumetric change because of global expansion.
Is a passing that are important because they can measure, constrain, and quantify GIA when you look at a spatial suite of data across somewhere like the British Isles or North America, where you've got that, um, you know, that different um, GIA signals over a relatively short um, land area. You can provide evidence of past ocean response to climate change, so those meltwater pulses and those sea level jumps. Um, can all be uh, illustrated in, in, in paleo data. And the last thing is you can extend the record back beyond the instrumental um, record and look at what the anthropogenic input is to sea level change and when did modern sea level rise um, start. You can start to answer those really important questions. Um, okay, and then the last thing is just to draw your attention to um, some <coughs> key papers. So these I've drawn information from these papers um, in the lecture, um, and they're all really sort of relatively easy to read. So if you want to do some further work in this area.